How's it going there, everybody? My name is Samuel Fisher from Green Dispensary Marketing. Back again. Uh, excited to talk with you guys today and have a guest. His name is Joseph Friedman. He's a pharmacology expert. He's also an MBA. He is an expert on the scientific, legal, social, political, and financial aspects of mar medical marijuana. He's also a host of the CRX podcast and was a founding member of the Professional Dispensaries of Illinois. Friedman is known for his expertise in the medical cannabis industry. He's spoken nationally and has consulted with many people. He has good experience running a medical dispensary, and he's specifically known for helping medical marijuana patients get the best products to suit their condition. Really excited to talk with you, Joseph Freeman. How are you today? I'm doing fine, thanks. Uh, do you prefer Sam or Samuel? Uh, Samuel is awesome. Okay, Samuel, thank you very much. I'm thrilled to be here and glad to share good information for your audience. Awesome, well, let's jump right into this. And so you have a lot of experience in the medical cannabis industry and in my opinion you're the leader in the prohibition uh movement right now and so i have some questions about uh specifically medical cannabis that i'd love to hear your opinion on uh let's jump right into this and so given such tight restrictions and threats from prohibitionists why did you enter the cannabis industry well well let me just make one correction it's anti-prohibitionist uh, not not for prohibitionists, but uh, you know, I got into the industry. I started thinking about it in 2013. Um, I knew uh, legalization was coming to Illinois, and you know, the idea of opening up a medical cannabis dispensary was very attractive to me. Although I didn't know a lot about it. Um, I mean, you know, back in the day, I <laughs> I smoked some pot with my friends during uh, you know high school and so forth, but uh, never really thought of it as as a as something that was medical. And being a pharmacist, I was intrigued by the idea of that. And so, what I did just early on is I made appointments with uh, many dispensary owners in Denver on Broadway Street. And uh, you, you can't walk into those dispensaries like looking like me. Um, an older guy, uh, you know, where they're, they're going to believe that you are who you are. They'll probably think that you're someone with the FDA. So, um, so you know, setting up those meetings was very important. And I did meet with three or four dispensary operators in, in, in Colorado and in Denver. And I, I learned a lot. I, actually, what I learned was just how not to do it in Illinois once I opened up my dispensary. And, uh, and such, you know, we uh, formed a partnership. Uh, two pharmacists and two lawyers, you know, it seemed like, like the perfect partnership. We had the expertise, you know, in healthcare. We also had the expertise on legal and that seemed like the perfect partnership. But let me just say one thing that sometimes the worst ship you can get on is a partnership. <laughs> so, uh, but I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later, what happened. Uh, but we did, we were successful getting um, a license to open up a dispensary just north of Chicago. And um, we called it PDI Medical, and our opening day was December 21st, 2015. Uh, in, um, you know, just north of us, maybe seven miles north of us, there was another dispensary that opened up, and they were the second dispensary to open up in Illinois. We were the 12th. And, you know, they had 400 people at their door on day one. And we had, you know, 45 days later, we had three people at our door on day one. So I, you know, we had to cut hours, cut staff, and you know, just to kind of you know keep the boat floating um, until people started to realize that we were just very different and very unique uh, compared to all the other cannabis dispensaries in Illinois. Uh, and 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 very, being different and unique was that you know I'm a pharmacist. I had other pharmacists on staff. I hired a hospice nurse. We developed relationships with two. Um, Illinois Colleges of Pharmacy, where fourth year pharmacy students um, were, you know, they, they need to do clinical rotations, six week clinical rotations. And for the first time, they were able to do one in a medical cannabis dispensary. And so there was a lot of excitement about that. And from 2016 on, we had uh, students from uh, Chicago State uh, College of Pharmacy and Roosevelt University College of Pharmacy coming in every six weeks to do clinical rotations and basically make my staff the most educated staff in the state of Illinois. And so this is one thing that I'm really, I really find interesting um, is your approach to helping patients and people like myself. I have scoliosis, for example, I'm a medical marijuana patient. And so walk me through this. Uh, how would you treat me if I were to walk into your dispensary today? Uh, <clears throat> well, um, well, you couldn't walk into my dispensary today because I sold it two years ago to a, a large MSO multi-state operator, but 
Um, when you came in, we would have you fill out a patient form, uh, similar to what you would fill out when you go to see a doctor for the first time. So all of your, you know, your, your information, your demographics, your family history, eating, sleeping, the drugs that you're on, so forth. So we would have all that information. We would set you into a conference room, and then I would be there, or one of my pharmacy students would be there, or both of us would be there, and we would go through everything about you as a patient, your goals of therapy, your concerns, uh, and then what you're trying to achieve with medical cannabis. And then we would have this discussion. Sometimes these consultations would last 20 minutes. Sometimes they would last two hours. So for you with scoliosis, we would go over everything about that. You know, we would go over the drugs that you're on. Sometimes there's drugs that you take that could be causing some of the issues that you're having. Um, serotonin syndrome is one thing that comes up quite often where there's two drugs to prescribe that cause this very uncomfortable condition and it's because of drug interaction so we would go through all that and then i would make recommendations on the cannabinoid profile so i would think of the cannabinoids the terpenes the flavonoids um, that might be beneficial for you i would take my notes and then i would bring my notes out to one of my product specialists i never used the term bud tender in my dispensary they were all product specialists and then they would select a product that was closest to what i was trying to give to the patient and then also the route of administration, whether it's um, inhalation, which we did very little of, but edibles, tinctures, patches, things like that. Awesome. That, that is so awesome. That is, I think it's really refreshing for many other dispensaries who would otherwise just take me in and just sell me whatever. Right. And so I'm also really interested in hearing what you're doing uh, to kind of help us go towards the path of legalization. And so uh, we spoke, personally about this. Uh, do you want to go ahead and talk about what you've been doing recently to help us out in this industry? Well, I think the, the path towards legalization includes um, dispelling the myths and the misinformation that's out there on cannabis. Um, I usually don't use the term marijuana, but, but I know in Pennsylvania, you know, it was very professional there. They had a pharmacist mandate. They were using the term marijuana, but that's, you know, that was that. Um, and so, you know, the idea of taking like the number one prohibitionist in the country who has offices in 30 states, and, and I've seen a, a lot of in, his, his information online. Um, I've, I've actually been in debates head to head with affiliates of this organization. And, and you know, th they were very interesting debates. And they always have the same story, you know, commercialization causes psychosis. Um, it's, it's hurting millions of people. Um, you know, and, and, and I always just approach that with just know you're, yeah, I don't say no, you're wrong. I say, well, you know, let's talk about the facts and the truth and balance science and really go there. You know, when they say it's, it's, it's harmed millions of Americans, I would, I would agree with that. Prohibition has harmed millions of Americans, not the plant itself. So, um, so I've, I've taken it to be one of my goals in life is I can't bring down these organizations, but what I can do is I can dispel the, their rhetoric, you know, by trying to get messages out to the masses through emails and social media campaigns to just uh, talk about the science, the truth, the facts, and that these prohibitionists usually have a platform that is cherry picked misinformation over exaggerations and what they look at is the bad players in the industry, and there are bad players in the industry, and focus on that because most are not. So in your opinion, uh, when they start to say that it's harming millions of Americans, uh, what, why do you think they're saying that? Why do you think that they keep saying that? And for the rest of us, what is the best data point that we can point to to show that that's not the case? <laughs> that's, a, that's a very broad question. Um, you know, I, I would think that their their point of reference on harming millions of Americans is, you know, looking at you know a few patients that come into emergency rooms with cannabis use disorder, and then extrapolating that out to a lot more people. Um, you know, I think the idea, you know, Alex Berenson, who used to be a New York Times um, um, newspaper guy, writer, whatever, in children's books, you know, wrote a book. 
uh, about psychosis and and marijuana and and how it's harming America. And 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 he was on Joe Rogan's show um, where Michael Hart was a doctor from Canada, and and they talked about it, and it was a great debate. And one of the things that um, Berenson brought up is all the teen, the female teen suicides that are happening, the increase. And and Dr. Hart just said, well, you know, you really can't look at cannabis as causing that. I mean, just look at social media and what's going on and all the bullying that's going on. So what they're doing is just spinning all kinds of stories into their narrative. And it's just, it's it's wrong. And and I'm that's what I'm I'm up against. Huh. So you're obviously doing a great job, kind of helping us uh, lead the charge in this battle. Uh, for the rest of us in this industry, whether it be a dispensary owner, uh, myself, or just any other cannabis entrepreneur, what do you think we can do? What steps can we take to help you and the rest of us be successful in going at least from Schedule One to Schedule Three? Well, why do we want to go to Schedule Three? <laughs> um, you know, I, I have an issue with that. Think about Schedule Three, and for the audience that doesn't understand what the scheduling is from um, the DEA, you know, Schedule One is our drugs that have no medicinal value and are highly dangerous and toxic. And you know, heroin, heroin's in there. Walter White's, you know, crystal meth is in there. Um, cannabis is in there. <laughs> you know, it, it doesn't make sense. Schedule three are, are drugs like like Valium and um, you know so, some other drugs like that that require a pharmacist to be on site in a healthcare facility to dispense. So how are you going to have all these dispensaries dispensing a Schedule three product? I think it's going to be a disaster. The my, my idea is that cannabis needs to be totally re, uh, descheduled. You know, keep the government out of it. Um, and, you know, I think the idea of, of, of opening up a successful cannabis dispensary, you know, I think there's a lot of um, competition out there. I think if you're getting into this business, I think it would be a good idea to, you know, focus a little bit on the patient, too, as well as the, the adult use patient. You know, try to try to set yourself up for being a go to place where patients talk to each other and say, yeah, there's someone there that's, you know, maybe got a healthcare degree or there's a professional there that, or someone very knowledgeable that can really help with, you know, someone who's on a bunch of drugs and has multiple co comorbidities. So you said your eventual goal here, um, I think I would agree with you, is that we get fully declassified and get treated like alcohol, correct? Yeah, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do you think... Uh, if you were to take a guess, uh, obviously you don't know the future. Do you think that this is plausible within the next five to ten years? I hope it's plausible by the end of this year. Um, you know, I think there's a lot of pressure. Um, you know, <laughs> during this during this um, election campaign, and I think the Democrats, you know, are pushing to legalize cannabis, and it'll probably be a Schedule Three. You know, I'm, I'm not unrealistic about at least that would be something better than schedule one but i think it'll happen at the end of this year i think they want to get the young vote and i think that'll help awesome well then i got a one more question for you then we could go on to dispensary ownership you have a lot of experience on being a dispensary owner um how do you see the relationship between medical cannabis and traditional ph pharmaceuticals evolving in the next five to ten years that's a great question, Samuel. Um, you know, one of the things that um, I mentioned earlier is where we had um, these pharmacy students, these fourth year pharmacy students coming in for six weeks to do clinical rotations. And one thing I did to prepare them um, three months in advance for their first day is I would send them an email that has a lot of links to a lot of information um, pro and con. So they would come in on their first day and hit the ground running rather than learning for the first two or three weeks and then helping out. So a lot of these pharmacy students came in and one of their requirements was to give two presentations during their six weeks. We would have staff meetings every Tuesday morning before we opened our doors for business. And we would have my crew sit around. I would sit there. We, we had a golden retriever, emotional support dog. 
that was there also. Uh, and that's a whole nother story. But anyways, so this pharmacy student would talk about qualifying condition in Illinois and the drugs that are used for it and how cannabis could be a better choice. And, um, and, and so, you know, the, my staff just got very well educated on all of this. And, um, and, and I think pharmaceutical companies are afraid of cannabis. I think um, the, the, the companies, the, the pharmaceutical companies that are behind drugs for pain, sleep, anxiety, depression, things like that, they're losing hundreds of millions of dollars because patients are going to a much safer alternative, and that be, and that would be cannabis. And so, do you think the threat of cannabis being an alternative to these other traditional pharmaceuticals might be one of the reasons why we're having such a fight uh, towards legalization? Oh yeah, I mean, just think of the um, the lobbyists, the lobbyists for the pharmaceutical industry that are at, in Washington. Just think about how hard they're working to keep this illegal. Well, let's go ahead and move on. Um, you have a lot of experience uh, being an entrepreneur in this industry, and you have a lot of advice that you could help uh, give towards others. And so let's start this right off with uh, what, what do you think are the best opportunities right here, right now, today for other entrepreneurs in the cannabis industry? Where should they be looking? What opportunities should they be jumping on? Well, I think a good idea is to be aware of what's happening at the state level. So if you're, if you're, you know, if cannabis is legal, either medicinally or adult use in over 30 states. So, you know, there's still 20 odd states out there that still don't have legalization. So I think it's a good idea to be um, in tune with what's happening at, at the state level with regards to legislation that is going to be legalizing cannabis. So, you know, being aware of that and then being aware of time frames and being aware of town hall meetings and, and things like that is a good idea just to have that uh, understanding of if it's going to happen in your state. For the states that already have a program, well, maybe they're going to be expanding the program. You know, I think what's happening is um, a lot of states are uh, giving out licenses for adult use rather than medical because they, they're they're looking at the dollars they're looking at the tax dollars and so um you know that would be like for example in illinois uh there's uh, there's 55 medical dispensaries and i think the amount of adult use dispensaries has eclipsed that um and you see billboards all over the place and you know it's, it's not medical it's all adult use so, I, you know, I think I'm getting off track as far as answering your question. Uh, yeah, so the question is specifically, what are the best opportunities for entrepreneurs entering the cannabis industry? Well, you know, I always believe ownership is the best way to go. Um, I think, you know, I was there, <laughs> you know, 10 years ago at a very good time where, you know, I, I you know, dispensary licenses were, were out there. And if you can get one of those coveted dispensary licenses, that wasn't a guarantee, you know, that, that you were going to be successful, but it was at least a chance to make your mark, do something in marketing and, 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 and outreach to make your dispensary uh, successful. And, 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 and professionalism was what, was what we used. I'm not sure how much that really would fly today because I think, again, the money is, is in adult use. It's transactions. Um, you know, the more transactions, the, the, you know, the better you are. These companies are publicly traded. So they're, they're all about, you know, profit and loss and, and, and balance sheets. Uh, so for the entrepreneur that wants to get into the industry, be aware of what's happening at the state level. Um, I think, uh, and marry up with 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 others that that believe in the idea of getting into this business. You know, start to form a, a plan of action. You know, once your state legalizes or once your state puts out more licenses, you know, raise the money. I mean, raising the money is so important right now. That's all dried up. I mean, a lot of these you know big MSOs, multi-state operators. You know, their stocks are like you know in the in the in the 1.5 cents to you know five dollar range and they've all come down from their highs from february of 2020 because legalization was supposed to happen and it didn't when the democrats got into office 
So, so these, these big MSOs used to use their stock as um, bargaining chips when they would purchase dispensaries. They're like, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll give you 80% stock in our MSO and 20% cash. And all of these people that took those deals are, are underwater because those stocks are all in the crapper. So, so I think just raise money um, or put money, enough money together to be able to get into the business and be aware of what's happening at state level. I don't know if that really helped. That, that's very helpful. Uh, let's follow that up. I actually have a lot of people following me who, when you get to the part where you're talking about, oh, you got to raise money, uh, that's one of their pain points. And so what would you recommend is the best way to raise money? Well, let's start, let's phrase this two ways. Um, how much money do you think a new entrepreneur would need to start a, a dispensary? And what is the best way to go about raising that, in your opinion? Okay. Well, you know, you, you know, with the federal illegality of cannabis, you know, going to banks or savings and loans really isn't an option, you know, for borrowing money. Um, you know, the best thing is to work with people that have access to, to a large amount of funds. And, 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 but, you know, be careful with those people because you don't, you want their money, but you don't want them take, totally taking over if you have this idea and vision. Um, you, I mean, it's a very delicate balance of accepting their money and, and allowing, you know, too many chiefs, you know, to be running the dispensary. Yeah, that's a, that's a great response. Um, I also wanted to follow up. Uh, your specialty is uh, you're, you're a pharmacology expert. And so I'm sure you're not the only one out there that wants to have a medical dispensary that is a, has a patient first approach. Uh, what advice would you give them entering the business and also kind of assurance that they'll be able to make it in this industry? What would you say? I mean, that's a great question. Um, you know, the only licenses that are out there are adult use licenses. Now, you know, one of my pharmacy students, uh, her and her sister, they're both pharmacists. They, um, uh, <laughs> I have to get updated. I haven't been in touch in a while. But I know they were with a group that wanted to open up a dispensary, and it was an adult use dispensary, but they wanted to use their expertise in cannabis and being healthcare professionals to be a part of that. And, and I think this is another case where, you know, the guys with the money were kind of pushing them out um, and minimizing their involvement in the dispensary operation. Um, I think I got off track again with that question. Uh yeah, specifically for pharm pharmacologists, experts like yourself who want to have a patient-first dispensary, uh, what kind of advice would you give to them and assurance that they'll be able to make it into this industry and also be profitable? Okay, well, well I think, you know, if you open up a dispensary and it's an adult-use dispensary, I, th I think you bring someone on board that has, you know, some kind of you know, professional background, um, a nurse, a pharmacist, uh, you know, and, 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 and has that background in, 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 in cannabinoid therapy as well. Um, and then market that. And then, and then you know, the word will spread amongst patients that you're a go-to place. Like, for example, when I was running my dispensary, um, you know, doctors in Illinois couldn't uh, recommend a dispensary to a patient. All they can do, they, they really couldn't do that. But I had one doctor who would go through the list of dispensaries, would certify a patient, and then go through the list. Well, there's a dispensary in this location, there's a dispensary in this location, and this dispensary in this location has pharmacists. And, and then you know, and then the patient would just go, oh. And, and, and so that's how this doctor got around recommending our dispensary. But that's how she would do it. A quick follow-up question. Uh, what are the major, in your opinion, uh, given what you know uh, as a dispensary owner, um, you, you mentioned marketing is one of the things that uh, new dispensary owners should be looking at. In your opinion, what are the best ways to market your new dispensary or existing dispensary? Uh, my wife, who, who's a marketing expert, uh, <clears throat> joined our dispensary after about a year. And uh, she was putting out our newsletter and every patient that came in, you know, we would get their information and their email address. And so, 
you know, we were sending our newsletters out to, you know, over 2,000 people on a, on, a, on a monthly basis. And the newsletters letters included stories, like patient stories about their success using cannabis. And that would go out and we would, we would do outreach um, events where we would get in front of a, a group of seniors in a nursing home or in a, in a senior living facility and, uh, and I gave a lot of presentations in those environments and I would always leave time because you need to leave a lot of time for the Q&A. So I would, I would shorten my presentation because they, you know, they, they all have a need. They all have an issue and they all want to know if cannabis can help. So do you think it sounds like uh, kind of making yourself available, doing your newsletter, setting, gathering an email list, setting out the email list? Do you think making yourself available as the CEO is one of the best ways to market your cannabis dispensary? Yeah, I was, I was there, you know, all the time. And so I was the go-to person. And of course, you know, my staff was great. Um, and then we had the pharmacy students and it was, you know, it was such a unique, think about Samuel, think about walking into a doctor's office or in a pharmacy. Do people talk to each other about what they're taking and how it's working? No one has any conversations. In our dispensary, people would be in line. We, we had two cash registers. They'd be talking to each other about what they were using and how they were manipulating it and what was working. I mean, it was just, and then at the end of the day, you know, if it was a good day, um, I mean, we would just do a, like a, a kumbaya, like, you know, I mean, we were all in it, you know, to, to be successful. And I wasn't above cleaning toilets. And so I had the respect of my staff and, and, um, and of course, I, I respected them and, and we worked together. It wasn't about money. It was about helping patients. Awesome. Hey, what did you find were the biggest day-to-day -day challenges being a dispensary owner? Were the biggest pain yeah. points? Well, at, at, in the first year, we were inspected by the state inspectors four times. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Being a pharmacist, I've worked in pharmacies, and I, I think maybe you see a state inspector once every two years. So, so you know, they had their 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 modus operandi was to walk in unannounced by surprise, and then catch us doing something wrong and fine us. And that that was their modus operandi. And so, the first you know visit by a state inspector into the second visit, I mean. You know, we were, we, we were, we were not doing well. We got fined a lot and we were doing a lot of things wrong and we fixed all that. And by the third and the fourth inspection that first year, we were the darling of the state inspector and we, and they used us as the example of a, a well-run uh, dispensary that's doing everything the right way. If you don't mind me asking, what were you doing wrong, quote unquote? Well, um, when we first opened, um, you know, one of the big fines we got was selling flour to a minor. And, you know, this minor was a patient and their parents were caregivers. But that's all we had was flour at the time. And the, the, the parents came in with this, with this six or seven year old that has had a severe seizure disorder. And we had this thing in our display case called an easy butter maker. So we, we, we would take a, a particular flower with a certain cannabinoid profile, you know, percentages. And when we would work with, with the parents to say, okay, you put this into this device, make an oil. This is what you're going to get out of it as far as milligrams of THC and CBD and all the other. And, 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 we, and we, would, we would guide them towards how to dose their child and you know, put it into a Rice Krispie treat or a brownie and, and to help their seizure disorder. And it worked. And the state inspector came in and said, have you sold any cannabis to a minor? We said, well, no. And they said, well, let me see. You know, we, we were using BioTrack THC as our, as our uh, POS system. And uh, the state inspector would look at, well, yes, you did. You sold, you know, three grams of whatever to the, well, I said, well, you know, well, we did, but this is what we did. And we still got fined because we weren't supposed to sell flour to a minor. So, you know, that was a learning lesson that you just can't do things that the state is against the state rules. So what, what kind of advice would you give to people who are kind of new to these massive legal land field that we basically have in the cannabis industry? 
how, how do you recommend responding, whether it be inspectors, letters that come in the mail, phone calls? Uh, what was your preferred method? So say you have an inspector come in and say, hey, you're, you're selling flour to a miner. Uh, what is the best way to kind of respond to that and get a positive response from the state itself? Well, um, you know, there, there really is no way to do that. Um, you went up against the rules. You're not supposed to sell flour to a miner. And we got fined for it, and we, we didn't do it again. Fortunately, we got additional types of products, you know, down the road that we can help the patient with oils and things like that. Um, you know, but, and, you know, one, one time the inspector came in and we had our golden retriever there and we were kind of concerned about that, you know, having a dog in the dispensary. And the inspector was like totally cool with that. And we didn't expect that, but that was very cool. And, and the fact that, you know, a couple of these inspectors were pharmacists and we were a pharmacy centric dispensary, I think, you know, made us a darling of the state. So, you know, we, I was always concerned uh, about the idea that the feds would come in with battering rams and break down our door and, you know, take our product, take our cash and put us in jail. That never happened. Okay. You know, but when I gave presentations at pharmacy conventions around the country, um, that would be a common question. Like, you know, I don't want to go to jail. And I would say, well, you have to balance the risk versus the reward. And, you know, I think it's a minimal risk. It didn't happen to me. And the reward is, is, is helping patients. And this is what these pharmacists want to do. Awesome. Could you share any experiences uh, where you had to adapt your business strategies in response to the changing market or maybe legal changes? Do you have any examples that come to mind? Well, you know, I, a strategy for changing direction. Um, at the time, um, you know, we had been in business for four years. We had, you know, we, we had gotten very successful. Uh, a lot of patients loved us. People were coming from miles away just to go to our dispensary. People were coming from other dispensaries to our dispensary, you know, when they had a bad experience. Um, we did a lot of handholding. And... Um, in time, uh, some of the big MSOs were wanting to buy us out. And so we were starting to have those kinds of negotiation meetings. And um, we wound up, you know, at the same time, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, about partnerships. Um, had a, you know, I had a couple of partners that just, you know, weren't very helpful and were downright toxic. Um, and so... I and my one good partner, a good friend of mine who's an attorney, uh, just decided, you know, let's just get out now, you know, because adult use was coming. We weren't sure that we wanted to do what the state was requiring us to do, which was, okay, you're a medical dispensary. When, when it goes adult use, you'll have to be a medical and an adult use dispensary. Plus, you'll have another license to open up another adult use dispensary. Well, that's going to be very expensive to open up another dispensary, plus convert our very unique medical dispensary into half medical, half adult use. And um, we just said, no, I don't want to do that. And plus getting those bad partners out of our life was a, was a big plus. And so we got out and, and then that big MSO offered me a job. So I said, sure, I'll, I'll take a job. <laughs> I wasn't even interviewed. And I was there for two years working on patient-oriented projects, a national hospice program, a pharmacy residency program, a telemedicine program, um, all kinds of things. But the company was really focused on branding their, 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 their dispensary uh, uh, presence. And so, you know, all of those patient-oriented projects you know, never got anywhere. And I went to HR after a couple of years. I said, what am I doing here? And they said, well, Joe, you're right. You know, we sort of changed direction since we hired you. We no longer need your services. I said, okay, fine. You know, uh, and I moved on. Uh, you see, you've brought up partners twice now. Um, I have some people in my following who are doing just that. They're, they're partnering up with other people uh, to share funds. What would you, what advice would you give to them to avoid having some sort of toxic partnership, as you were mentioning. What kind of advice, what kind of tips would you give them? <sighs> Go with your gut. 
Um, the, um, the first time, uh, well, as we were getting ready to submit applications, uh, we needed a, a large source of, of money. Um, I mean, I had money, my other good partner had money, but we didn't, what we did was we wanted to submit three, um, uh, applications for dispensaries in three different dispensary districts. And if we were able to get one dispensary, we would consider that a win. So that required a lot of, you know, our, our applications were 400 pages long and that required. <laughs> And imagine putting together three of those uh, with some differences based on location. And, and so, so my, my, my good partner, the lawyer, he worked for a law firm and it was an old guy that ran the law firm and he wasn't interested in investing, but he had a son that was passionate about cannabis. And so I said, okay, well, we had a meeting at the law office. You know, it was um, my, my friend, uh, the old lawyer and his son, we were in a conference room and, and after the meeting, um, I went back to my friend's office. We closed the door. I said, you got to fucking be kidding me. You know, that son is the dumbest person I've ever met. And, um, and my friend said, well, you know, he's, you know, I, I've known him for years and we can manage him. But that really wasn't the case. Um, you know, he, he wound up becoming a real problem. And, uh, and, and anyways, it, it, it all worked out. But it, you know, I think for people that, are forming partnerships, you know, go with your gut feeling. My gut feeling was that, you know, this old man and his son were not going to be good partners. But at the time we were caught between a rock and a hard place as far as needing a lot of money. What eventually happened because we only got one license, you know, we refunded back, you know, two thirds of what the old man gave us, you know, based on the idea of getting three dispensaries. So we were all about equally into it anyways, financially. Um, so yeah, just be careful who you get in bed with. Yeah, definitely, definitely, definitely. You never know what you're getting yourself into uh, with people that you don't know really well. I think that's great advice. Let's follow up. Um, we kind of touched upon this earlier. Um, I'd like to be a little bit more direct. Um, what innovations right now or uh, new exciting things in the cannabis industry do you think are going to have the biggest impact of growth in the future of the industry, whether it be, for example, maybe you saw a new product uh, that lets you make edibles in a special way. What do you think? What do you think is going to be the next big thing? A couple of things. And, you know, I think education is, is a big thing. I think getting education out to the masses as well as in dispensary organizations is very important. Let me, let me show you something. Yeah. Um, Can you see that? Uh, kind of. The periodic table of molecules, cannabis periodic table of molecules. Yeah, yeah, there's, I don't know how to make this work. Uh, anyways, so what this is, um, is, uh, let me see if I can. About eight months ago, I, I worked, I'm on the scientific advisory board of an organization that um, is involved with cannabis education. And uh, we had this Zoom call, and you know, they had this idea of creating a periodic table, you know, that would be educational for cannabis. And I said, "Well, has anyone ever done this before?" And so we all looked online, and we have found a bunch of them out there. They're for sale on Amazon, uh, and it's all you know in nomenclature names: Ghost Train Haze, Maui Wowie, you know. Uh, you know, with pictures of flowers, very colorful, some medical information, and, and it looks like a periodic table. And I said, well, no one's ever, and, and we looked hard, but we found that no one's ever done the molecules of the cannabis plant, the cannabinoids, the terpenes, the flavonoids, the precursor acids. So I was tasked with um, creating the list, and I did a lot of research. And, and I turned over uh, 51 molecules, cannabinoids, terpenes, flavonoids, precursor acids, to a, a graphic designer who created this table. And then we turned it over to an intern who created 80, 187 pages of scientific data supporting um, all of these molecules. And, and they're organized in their specific categories by molecular weight. 
And, um, and there's going to be an interactive version of this uh, that's being created right now where you're going to you know, click on a molecule and you'll see what it does and all the scientific data behind it. And then um, you'll be able to uh, uh, go into a, a pull-down list where there's going to be 40, 45 medical conditions. You'll click on a condition and then the molecules that address that, you know, could be a handful, will light up and you print that, bring it to a dispensary and say, hey, I want a product that has this, this, and this in it. And plus, we're going to use it as a blueprint for creating FDA-approved pharmaceuticals. Uh, we're, the company is working with a group out of Boston, Harvard, educated doctor, and they've got experience with the drug development process and a doctor in Illinois who has 10,000 patients. So we're going to do a preclinical trial with a handful of molecules um, for specific, you know, one, two, three, four types of conditions and then sell that eventually to pharma or to an OTC company. Okay, this sounds really cool. I'm, I'm not a pharmacist. Uh, I'm not a scientist. And so some of that went over my head, and I'm sure many listening also went over their head. But to kind of clarify, essentially what you have is a periodic table. And so you picked apart the different molecules in the cannabis plant. And uh, when somebody selects one of them, they can find... There's over 400. There's over 400 molecules. We selected 51 that have documented uh, information about them. And so essentially what this is going to turn into ideally is you can open up a chart whether it be a website or something like that. You select one of the molecules and then you get a list of strains and products that they can buy to best help the condition and also the conditions that it best serves, correct? No, no. No, correct. No, you, you, yeah, you, you click on a molecule and what will pop up is, you know, is it anti-inflammatory? Is it, you know, pro-appetite, appetite you know, stimulating or, or whatever? Um, is it for pain? Uh, and, and so you get that information. So this, this chart will be hung in doctor's offices. Um, and, and the interactive version will be, you know, the pull down list where you, you hit, um, seizure disorders and the molecules that address seizure disorders and the ones that do it the, the most, there's the most documented ones. I mean, for inflammation, for example, 80% of these molecules address inflammation. Well, there's some molecules that have a lot of research behind it. Others don't have as much. So the molecules that address that condition with the most research behind it will pop up, light up, and you print that and bring it to a dispensary and say, do you have a product that has, you know, mycerine and TH, you know, THCA and you know, you know, some of the other molecules in it that, that, that popped up. So does that make sense? I think so. Do you have a website or something for those listing that they can go to, to learn more about this or some sort of Yeah. Yeah. The name of the organization is accountability, A C A N N ability okay, uh, like it sounds yeah hang on let me just <laughs> double check that yeah this is a -A -N, yeah a c a n n a can ability dot com and and they're the, they're the educational organization behind this periodic table you know I, i'm on the scientific advisory board i just i'm the architect of this periodic table um so they're working on the interactive version now but there probably is some information about it on their website so accountability.com. Awesome. That is definitely something for everybody in the industry to be looking forward to, uh, keeping tabs on, also learning more about. Other, uh, other innovations. Um, there was a guy that I was supposed to meet with um, tomorrow who was behind um, a device that cooled down the heat, the temperature of combustion and vaporization that made it a lot healthier. And, um, you know, we were touch on LinkedIn. He sent me all these studies. He was going to come in from St. Louis to meet with me. And I was going to, you know, get a couple of samples of his device. You know, there's no water, no electricity. Somehow it just cools down the vapor. And, and then he disappeared on LinkedIn. So, so I, I <laughs> I don't really know what happened there. Um, he just decided, well, I'm not going to come in and meet you and goodbye. Uh, you know, so whatever. Um, 
and and then there's another company, and I'm trying to remember their name. Um, they've got like little bottles of of liquid uh, and very highly concentrated cannabinoids. You know the different, you know CBC. You know, uh, you know some of the other ones that that seem to have a lot of data research behind them, uh, and and they're they're selling it out there. I mean, this is like nanotechnology. Well, you brought up something. Uh, this is a question I wanted to ask. This is a really good time to do it. Given your expertise, uh, what you know about health, uh, being a pharmacist, a pharmacology expert, um, what is the safest means of consumption of the cannabis medicine? Whether it be vaporizing, consumption, smoking, what do you think? And the inhalation route is probably the most satisfying, the most quick act, quick acting. I see the attraction for it. Um, we had a representative from like uh, a, a vape company come to our dispensary when we were running it and he wanted to see, you know, what was our split between, you know, selling flour and vape and edibles and tinctures. And then, you know, we were able to produce a report and he was really surprised because our dispensary um, sold the least amount of flour from all the other dispensaries that that he that he visited that produced these same reports. So so uh, we were always recommending um, edibles and tinctures and RSOs and things like that over inhalation. We sold we sold inhalation products, but we because you know <laughs> there's no drug that you inhale unless it's through a vaporizer you know like you're, you're asthmatic or something like that and that's cold inhalation um so there isn't combustion there isn't uh, the soot and the and, and 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 the carbon that gets into your lungs there isn't the high temperatures of vaporization that can be damaging to your lung alveoli um so i i know it's out there and but I think long term it could be an issue for a lot of people that are inhaling cannabis for you know years and decades. Do you think there's any risk for consumption? I, I personally don't smoke. I, I only consume uh, edibles, for example. Is there a risk to doing that, whether it be the liver, or digestive system? Or what do you think, given what you know? Yeah, I think there's a big risk if you're getting those products from the black market. <laughs> um, because you just don't know the impurities that are in there, um, heavy metals, pesticides, insect legs, you know, things like that. If you're going into a, a regulated legal dispensary, um, no one has ever died of cannabis. You would have to take, you would have to smoke like 10,000 joints in 15 minutes to, to, it's not uh, you know, <laughs> you can't get talk. So, so the idea that you know there there's 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 issues with your with with digesting um, yeah there could be some issues I, I I just don't think it's it's out there and published in a big way yeah awesome well I have a couple more questions for you, you don't want to take too much of your time really respect your time I appreciate you having uh, you here to talk with me um, I wanted to also address uh, the idea of exit strategies. And so many people who are coming into this industry wanting to buy their own dispensary, they come from a wide range of different industries, whether it be construction, accounting, whatever. And so they'll come in with some money and they want to have a dispensary and they want to make some money. And that's their main goal. What would you recommend for them as an exit strategy? If that's something that they're looking for, what's the, what's the best way to come in, make some money and get out profitably? I think understanding the market, understanding, you know, the, 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 the valuations of dispensaries that are being sold. Uh, you know, I think, you know, we didn't have an exit strategy. Um, we never thought about that, you know, but it, but circumstances and situations came up that we needed to think about getting out and exit strategy. And, and we got out right before COVID too. So, you know, I guess you know, that was very fortunate. Um, but to, just to have an exit strategy is a good idea. But if you're going to get into this business, you're going to open up, you've got to work on building a successful business. 
And then the exit strategy, you know, give it, you know, two years, three years, five years, whatever the time frame is that you want to be busting your butt, you know, running this thing and making it successful. And, and then and then having an understanding before you even get into it, are dispensaries, you know, are they being sold? What, what's the valuation? Um, it, you know, I think the idea of these dispensaries selling for millions and millions and millions, which is where they were five years ago, that's not the case anymore. I think competition is up. There's a, a lot of dispensaries that are out there. And I think a lot of people getting into this industry are getting really disappointed because you know, they want to get out and they can't sell for, you know, they're taking a loss when they sell it or they're selling it for, you know, minimal, minimal um, increases in, in, you know, over above what they paid for it. So, so I, I think, you know, sorry, go ahead. No, I, I just think you just have to really be smart about this. So would you say, would you recommend playing the long game longer than five years is the best way to go if you're really trying to come in here and have the best shot at succeeding? Yeah, five years sounds good. Um, you know, I, I think in five years, you'll, you know, I mean, things are changing. You know, legalization could be happening at the, at the end of this year. I mean, there's a lot of things that could be happening. I mean, businesses, like, for example, there was this one business that we consulted. I had a consulting company called Canna RPH, and we helped two groups, um, one in Ohio, one in Pennsylvania. And, um, you know, the one in Pennsylvania sold their, well, they wound up, after they opened up their one dispensary, Pennsylvania law allowed them to open up two more. And after successfully operating three dispensaries for a number of years, you know, they sold for a, <laughs> a ton of money. And, and the big difference between our consulting company and other consulting companies that would charge $250,000 for their services, and we, we, we didn't charge that much. But what we would want is just a little piece of equity um, when they sold. And, and so, you know, that turned into a nice windfall um, and, and uh, it worked out pretty well for us. And so one, one thing I've noticed, uh, there's a lot of big players, whether people like Beyond Hello, Men, Men, uh, people that kind of come in uh, with what seems to be the idea of kind of buying up these smaller dispensaries, whether it be to eliminate competition, boost the revenue, whatever. What do you think about that idea of building up a dispensary just to sell it to one of these bigger brands? Well, um, <clears throat> state by state, are these bigger brands, these bigger MSOs, are they allowed to, maybe they're maxed out already in that particular state on the number of dispensaries they can own. I know in Illinois, there's a limit of how many dispensaries an individual can own or a, 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 an individual organization can own. So I think understanding what those limits are um, and, and are, you know, but you know, there's still groups that are coming in that want to buy a bunch of dispensaries. So there's that going on too. There's there's money behind those those people. So, but again, it's it's a it's a crapshoot. Uh, well, one, one more question for you, um, kind of just to leave us on a good good note. Um, actually, if we could make it two, that would be ideal. <laughs> just a quick one right now, and um, then another really quick one. Um, if you could speak to all the dispensary owners directly to them right now, and give them the best advice, the, the number one tip that you have in your mind, what would you say? Focus on your customer. You know, if your customer is a patient, make sure you focus on that patient. Um, give, them a good, give them a good experience. You know, don't let it just be a transaction. Don't try to, don't try to oversell them cannabis. Don't try to you know, give them what they need. I mean, we had, Patients, after I did a consultation, I would say, yeah, I don't think you're a candidate. And, and, and there's reasons for that. Um, and so we would send patients out without buying anything. So I think just <clears throat> having that kind of approach of helping people is, is probably a good, good piece of advice. Great advice. And finally, if you're comfortable answering, what's your favorite strain and means of consumption? My favorite strain and means of consumption? I don't have a favorite strain. Um, I look at the cannabinoid profile. Um, I look for combinations of THC and CBD. Um, and I look for them in an edible. 
Um, I always like the idea of CBD because CBD has benefits. Um, of course, THC. You know, the prohibitionists love to say how THC is the devil. Um, yeah, but there was a there was a study that that was done on laboratory rats where um, they were given transplants, skin transplants, and the group that received the THC didn't reject those transplants. And the ones that didn't get the THC had all kinds of rejection issues, or, or trans, uh, not rejection issues, but uh, just issues with, with, the, with, with what they got, you know, the skin graft. And so that tells me that more research is needed because a lot of the patients that are getting organ transplants might be able to go on THC to prevent rejection of those organs. That is and so we just can't do the science. We just can't do the science because of, you know, schedule one status. That is so interesting. Um, that, that could get us into a whole other range of uh, topics and questions, and I'm just not ready for it, <laughs> to be honest with you. <laughs> but, okay. Mr. Friedman, um, it has been an honor to speak with you. Um, you've Thank given you. us some great Thank insights. Uh, one more time, it's, a, it's a, accountability.com is the mm -hmm. website where they can find the periodic uh, table of cannabinoids, right? Is that how you say it? Cannabis molecules. Cannabis molecules. And uh, yeah, definitely look into that. Um, it's something to look forward to in the cannabis industry, one of the big trends, um, as well as hopefully legalization this year, yes. if not soon. Yes. We'll see. That's my hope. But thank you so much for letting me talk with you um, and wish you the absolute best. Thank you, Samuel. I, I appreciate this, this opportunity and you have a good time or a good day. And uh, thank you.